Thank you for the word, Father, this morning. Thank you for your speaking to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so we're going to go to a real a classic passage. There are some passages that we should preach on it on a regular basis because they are important. So how would you like it if uh, uh, whatever your endeavor is and whatever your field is, right, you have people that excel in it and that you admire? One of the best things in life that we can do is to talk to people who uh, know how to do something, who are experts, real experts, not pretend experts, but real experts and who are successful at things. For example, in my field, I love to spend an hour with uh, Smith Wigglesworth and ask him a few questions. I'd love to spend uh, an hour, because any time I've done that, spend some time with, 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 uh, with, with any of these ministers that, uh, that are really doing something, it's always been very helpful. Because in just talking to them a little bit, you can get a lot in 30 minutes, you can get a concentrated uh, of, you can get a whole college course, 22 hours in 20 minutes of some thoughts or advice that they might have. Like if you, now this is going to date me, but if you are, uh, if you like basketball player, wouldn't you like, in Europe, you play basketball, wouldn't you like to spend 30 minutes with Magic Johnson, right? I know that dates me now. There are other players now, right? But in my time, it was him, right? And so you go, well, you know, just show me this, show me that. I mean, he can show you things, right? Hockey, Wayne Gretzky. I know that dates me too, right? There's others, right? But, uh, you know, I, 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 I like uh, Pelé. Pelé, you know, could bend the ball around the wall and just, uh, just ask him, I want to know how to bend the ball like that, like you do, you know, that you shoot it there. And it seems like it goes there. Or imagine spending, you know, an hour with Einstein asking him about uh, relativity or something like that, whatever it is, you know. Uh, so I booked 40 minutes this morning, an appointment, 40 minutes with, for you, with the one who knows it all. Are you interested? And we're going to get in on our conversation where he told someone that was about to launch in an adventure on how to succeed and do it right. Are you interested to get in on the conversation? So we're going to go to Joshua 1 where Moses just died. In verse 1, the death of Moses, right, servant of the Lord. It came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun. So whom is God speaking to now? Right? So this is the appointment. We're going to get in on a private conversation between God and Joshua. Because what I, now Joshua is about to step into something that was huge. He has to lead more than a million people, discontent, unhappy people, <laughs> they were not particularly happy, into uh, an endeavor called conquering the promised land. And so God gives them in this concentrated you know, anytime it's like this, you know, when, 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 when two people would meet, right, I would think, uh, and I know a conversation between, you know, uh, this, this, uh, this physicist or this, or, or, or someone like that, you think, I wish I could be a fly on the wall and hear what they said. Well, we can be flies on the wall here and hear what, is, what they said. And the great thing is this, is that whatever God told Joshua applies to us too. So if we will do what Joshua did, we're going to get the same results that he did. Joshua later at the end of the book, he says this, not one word of all the good promises that God has made has failed. You want to say that at the end of your life? Everything that God promised has come to pass. Not even one word has failed. And then he said, God kept his promise. He walked through and fulfilled. He conquered. He did what God told him to do. He succeeded in what God told him to do. 
<clears throat> now I apply this to my life and what, what God called me to do. You have to apply it to your life and to what God called you to do. But the principles of, are exactly the same. The principles are universal, right? So in verse 2, <clears throat> God tells Joshua directly, in verse 2, he says to him, you check me. Moses is dead, right? Verse 2, verse 2. Moses is dead. It'll come up. And the reason why it's significant is because um, saints don't die. See, you have to watch. This is, this is something that my friend, the believer, rabbi, the rabbi who's now a pastor, told me. He said, now, this is not true of every place. Then he gave me an example. He said, for example, what uh, 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 Bildad and Eliphaz said, this wouldn't apply. Every word that they say doesn't count. It's inspired, it's word of God. Bildad and Eliphaz, by the way, were Job's friends. But God, when they're finished, says, this is dark counsel. What are you people saying? And what you said is false. So it wouldn't apply to that. I don't care too much what Bildad said. Because God says <laughs> that's dark counsel. It's not true. They had to repent for what they said because they said a lot of wrong things. But in passages like this, where it's God speaking directly, every single word counts. So if God says, think about it, right? Paul never uses the word dead. He says, fall asleep. Believers fall asleep. Moses went up with God. Elijah went up with God. They don't die, they just go up. So if God says he's dead, he's trying to say something. So what he's telling him is, uh, you know, what happened was good. What happened was glorious. What happened needed to happen. But now it's you, it's your turn, and you have to do what I told you to do. You have to do what I tell you to do, and you have to do things the way that I'm telling you to do them. Because you're you and you're not Moses. We compare. God doesn't compare. The Bible says that comparing is foolish. So immediately people are thinking, well, will Joshua be like Moses? Will he part the Red Sea? Will he go up on the mountain and come down glowing in the dark? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and will he speak like Moses speaks? We go through all that foolishness all the time. Our camp went through it. When Kenneth Hagin went to heaven, people were saying, well, who's going to be the next Kenneth Hagin? Well, nobody's going to be the next Kenneth Hagin. Nobody's going to be the next Oral Roberts. Are you listening? Nobody's going to be the next because God doesn't want and God is not trying to redo what he did in the past. Glory moves and glory gets greater and greater and bigger and bigger. God is not doing the same or less. He's doing more. So we build on the past, but we move on. So Azusa Street was great. The charismatic revival was great. The healing revival was great. And, and, and everything else that came was great. But what is God doing today? What does he want to do today? So we're foolish and we compare. But God, there is, if when you read the text faithfully, there's not a hint of comparison. God is not telling him you're better, you're worse, right? He's just saying you're next. That's all you see in the text. Obey me, you're next, right? That was good. Honor it, right? But now, how do we present the gospel now? How do we communicate? How do you run your business now? How, whatever it is that you're doing, God wants to do something and wants to innovate. And he's given you an assignment. And so he's saying, it's your turn now. <clears throat> and you're next. Amen? Amen? And then he tells them in verse 3, what, 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 what phrase is coming up now in verse 3? He says to him, whatever you put your foot on, 
I will give you. Do you like that? Whatever the soul, the, 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 the traditional translations, the older ones say, whatever you trample on, whatever you step on. I picked uh, this one because I like it. It says, whatever the soul of your foot treads upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. So he says, whatever you step on, I will give you. You, now, in order to step on something, you have to see it. Would you agree? It? So you have to see it because if, if, you're, if, you're if you wake up in the middle of the night in a dark room, you don't see, you're not going to, you're going to trip over things. You have to see it, you have to step on it, and then it's yours. So I'm always amazed. I'm constantly wondering at things. Most of the time I wonder at good things, you know, the goodness of God, the power of God. Other times I wonder at the foolishness of humanity. And I wonder at how people can criticize what we preach, that God is good, that God answers prayer, that you can have what you say when the text says this. Because everything that we believe in all of our doctrine has, come from, has to come from Scripture. And it has to come faithfully from the text, in context, not taken out of context. That's why I like to take a passage and then work it and then let God speak to us. So in the text, in context, God says, if you step on it, you can have it. <laughs> right? If you step on it, you can have it. The equivalent in the New Testament is, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believing, you will receive. So if you're going to criticize that, you're going to have to answer this. But you can't, the only thing that you can do is say, I don't believe it. And I'll respect that. But you cannot say that God didn't say this. And you cannot say that we don't, as believers, have a, a, a responsibility to believe God for things and to walk in things. So he says, what I give you, God is saying, in order to possess it, you're going to have to step on it. So you and I have to mark off God's blessings by stepping on it. If you can step on it, you can have it. Look at your feet. Tell your neighbor, watch my feet. Right? I'm going to step on it. Say, I'm going to step on it. If you wonder, you know, once in a while, Connie has these prayer marches, walks. What they're about is exactly this. She's walking around... Because we believe that God has given us Barry, and he's called us to influence Ontario, Canada, and the world. But you start where you are. So if you want it, you have to step on it. I said, if you want it, you have to step on it. Right? You have to step on it, and you have to see it. So we are stepping on what God has given us. That's why she does what she does, right? So you apply it to your life. If you want a good marriage, you're going to have to walk in it and step in it. It doesn't happen automatically. You're going to have to get up and say, I will forgive. I will communicate. I will tell my spouse that I love her. I will. Otherwise, it won't. If you let things go the way that they go, usually they go into decay and chaos. <clears throat> If you want your business to grow, you're going to have to step on it, right? That means you're going to have to pray, get instructions from God, and it's a supernatural and a natural thing together. They go together. And then you're going to have to study. You have to innovate. You have to see what sells and what doesn't sell or, or, or what's successful or whatever. Whatever it is that you believe that God has given you, you have to step on it to possess it. Step on it to possess it. 
We're stepping, church growth doesn't happen by accident. We're stepping in it, we're believing, we're praying, we're standing for it. We are stepping on every Sunday someone will get born again. And then we will baptize people in water regularly. We're stepping on it and we're not moving from that. Doesn't matter if you believe in it, you don't believe in it, whatever. We step on it and we believe it. But you have to make it happen. You have to step on it. It's right there. Whatever <laughs> your foot steps on, he says, I have given you. Amen? Amen. I have given you whatever your foot steps on. And then in verse 4, we're going to skip to verse 4, God gives exactly what he's giving you from the Negev to the south to Lebanon to the north, the Euphrates River, River and the Mediterranean. So now watch. I mapped out this, what God has given him. Show the map. Show the map. There you go. That's, you, re, you recognize the Middle East there, right? That is what God had given him. So God said to him, this is yours. I have given it to you. Okay. Now you step on it. Now there's a couple of things here that go together. One is, if Joshua had stepped over on the left here, right, is Egypt. If Joshua had stepped over Egypt, could he have Egypt? No. <laughs> yeah. No. Because God said, step on what I've given you. This is what I've given you, step on it. If he had stepped over into Italy, could he have it? No. Because it wasn't given. You cannot, you and I cannot have something that's not given to us. Jesus said it to Nicodemus. He said, you cannot have something that's not given you. Why? Because God sets the limits. Are you listening? But, so that's the one side. Now the other side is once God has said this is yours, the converse is true also. In order to have it, you have to step on it. So it's possible that God is giving you something, right? And you don't have it because you don't step on it. Because if you don't step on it, you can't have it. Because God is not your butler. He's your God. He doesn't serve you. You serve him. <laughs> right? So he doesn't hand us things on a platter, but he sets the limits. Now, the way that this works is this. Uh, you can be a prophet if God said you're a prophet. I'm going to say it again. God calls God sets the limits, right? You can be an apostle if God says you're an apostle. You can't be an apostle if he doesn't call you to be an apostle. You can't call yourself to that. And you cannot, can I be a singer? Well, you can be a singer if God calls you to sing, right? Can I be a businessman? Well, I can be a business person, businessman, businesswoman. Yeah, if God called me, I can do it. But he has to call you to it. You know that that would end a whole lot of fighting and foolishness in churches right there, right? So the first job is to pray and ask God what he called you to do and get clarity on what he called you to do. And then stick, stick to what he called you to do. Don't step outside of it. <clears throat> After 40 years of, of, of doing this, it's 45 now. I have to stop saying 40 because it's 45, right? I've seen people called and, and fall flat on their face because they stepped out of what God called them to do. They could have been great help, great associate, great help in the church, and then try to do something on their own and just fall because they were not called. If you're called, it will work. If you're not called, it will not work. But the point is you have to stay in what God called you to do. I have invitations to go to India. Are you going? No, not unless God says go. Are you listening? Just because I could do something, it doesn't mean I should do it. I have invitations to go to the South Pacific. I'd, I'd like to, Maui, because we have, we have Ramas all over the world. So not Connie and I, but Rama has Bible schools all over the world. 
<laughs> Literally every director has called me, Brazil, Brazil. I'd li- I'd li- and there's some places I'd like to go, you know. Tw- we have 20,000 students in Brazil, 20,000 students. A couple of hundred schools just there. But well, why don't you go? Because I stay in what God calls me to stay. Because I'm a real stickler for that. I pray, right? And I check with God. God, do you want me to do this? Are you call me, you call me to this? Do you want me to do it? Because that's where the success is and that's where the protection is. I don't want to be like Jonah. God says, go to Nineveh and I end off going to Tarshish. And then I end off in the, in the, in the whale of a belly somewhere. Right? I, you know, God will still protect me because that's the grace of God, right? <laughs> Out of God's will, God protected him. But even the whale got so sick that it just vomited Jonah up on the shore and, and vomited him where he should have gone to begin with. <laughs> and the text says that. Read it. The fish, Jonah was complaining, oh God, why'd you do this? God, why'd you do this? Even the fish got sick. It wasn't God, it was Jonah. You know, if God says go to Nineveh and you go to Tarshish, that's like here, they're in the opposite direction. So if, if God tells me to go to Newfoundland and I go to Vancouver, I'm, I'm on my own and I'm in the opposite direction. And I will complain and wonder, God, why? God, why? And then, and it wasn't God. It was you, you, you're there. That, that's it. It was your choice. <clears throat> so, so make sure that that you know what God called you to do, right? If you're a teacher, be a teacher. If you're a business person, be a business person. If you are a stay-at-home mom, be whatever God called you to do. But then once you know, in order for that to work and become yours and reach its full, fullest, uh, uh, fullest, fullest potential that it possibly could, you're going to have to step on it. Right? And then, now watch what God says now. Just go with the text here, right? So he says, okay, I'm with you like I was with Moses. I'm with you like I was with Moses doesn't mean you're going to do what Moses, you're going you're gonna to be like Moses and act like Moses. Right? You can get a white suit and speak in an accent, you know, and take your coat off and hit somebody, you're not Benny Hinn. <laughs> and I, I'm allowed to say that because I was in a room with Benny Hinn with just 10 pastors, a pastor's office in Houston, Texas. And he told us to say that. He also told us to say that the, if congregation members had the same expectancy that they have when he does a meeting, we would get the same results. Thank you for your enthusiasm. That's another sermon, right? We would. Because we have the same anointing. We have the same spirit. We have the same, while we were crying, and the angels cry, holy, the anointing fell. But, you know, you don't, you, you don't, it, th- that went on in our camp too. You know, people think you get a haircut like Kenneth Egan and you twiddle your thumbs like Kenneth Egan and you talk like him, you're Kenneth Egan. You're not. I am with you like when Moses is not in the same, means this, my presence will be like you in the same way that it was with Moses. It doesn't mean you're going to get a rod and part a Red Sea. It doesn't mean you're going to go on a mountain and speak to God. It's talking about the presence. The promise is in the presence, not the methodology and the details. The details are going to be different because Moses is Moses and Joshua is Joshua. Two different calls. So you need to be the you that God called you to do because only, only you can do what God called you to do. Don't try to be something else. Don't try to be someone else. <laughs> be true to what God called you to do. And then he says to him, right, in, 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 verse, in, in, verse, in verse 5, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Do you like that promise? Isn't that good? You're starting out. You're going to do something. And then he says, no one will be able to stand against you. Does that apply to you and I in the New Testament? 
Yes, it does. In the New Testament, we say it this way. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Which means that no matter what's happening around me, the one inside of me is bigger and stronger. And if you have the greater one in you, the biggest one, the most anointed, right? Then obviously no difficulty will be able to stop you. No enemy will be able to stop you. No opposition will ever be able to stop you. Right? So no one will be able to stand against you. Right? And then he says to him, the rest of the verse, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. Right? I will never leave you. There it is. I will not forsake you. I'm going to ask you this. Does that apply to you and I today in the same way? Right? In the New Testament, specifically to the believer, do I have it on the PowerPoint? Says, I will never leave you, book of Hebrews. I will never leave you nor forsake you, right? Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Because God said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. <clears throat> so now you're armed, fully ready. You have a call. You have a uniqueness. God says, this is what I called you to do. That's your starting place. What did God call you to do? And then he says, now you got to step on it. And then he says, don't worry about anything because I am with you. So as God was with Moses, as God was with Joshua, as God was with David, as God was with Paul, as God was with Peter, as God was with John, as God was with Jesus, we're allowed to say, so he is with us. Jesus prayed that. He said, you give them the same glory that I have given to my followers, those who believe in me. And then we're armed with the promise, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Well then, I'm now ready to go. Thank you, God. Great. Time to go. Bye-bye. I'm going to go. But God continues. It doesn't end here. It's like, you know, that's all I need. Would you say that's all you need? I would say that's pretty good. I think, the, I think the thought should end there. So God throws a curve here. The, 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 the next verse, verse six, verses 6 and 7 are curves. They're not expected in the text. So he says, give me the verse first to go, go back up, right? Be strong and of good courage. Well, hold on. Why do I need to be strong and courageous? I have a call. You're sovereign. You've done it all. You called me. You told me you'll never leave me. Why do I need this? I mean, all I need is just you. So here's some other translations, right? He says, be strong and brave. Dear God. Everybody say, be strong. Say, be brave. Now here's another translation. Another translation says, be determined and confident. But say, determined. Now say, confident. But see, see, that's not even language that believers use. Like, we, we never know. We're supposed to, you just never know. We, believers are not supposed to be confident. If you're religious, you can't be. Confidence and religiosity don't go together. It's the opposite. What's going on here? Do you see it? Now, this is verse 6. Now, okay, now i got to reflect on this. I wonder why I have to be courageous. Why do I have to be strong? Why do I have to be brave? Why do I have to be determined? Why do I, do I have to be confident? But then in verse 7, he repeats it. Now, God repeats it. This is really, really serious. 
He says that again, just in case you didn't get it the first time. Let me say it again. Be, but, but he, 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 he goes deeper. He goes stronger. He says, be strong and very courageous. Again? Again? Right? So some other translations. Look. <laughs> Make sure you're strong and brave. If we say strong, strong. say brave. brave. Are you getting the point here? You, you can't be a wimp. Stop whining. Stop complaining. Stop being a wuss. Can I say wuss from the pulpit? Is that, is that a problem? Yeah, I don't put me, I don't know, just me. Oh, God, 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 why me, God? Right, stop. So, so now you think about it. Do I have another translation of this? Yeah. Be determined and be confident. That's the good news Bible. Be determined and be confident. Dear God, you know, that's like, be strong. So why would God say that? Well, obviously because you're going to need it. So if I say to you, you know what, I have deposited uh, $10,000 in the bank for you at such and such a bank, okay, and, but you got to go there and sign a paper so that you can cash it. They need your signature and your ID. But on your way there, be careful. What does that imply to you? that there's going to be some obstacles getting to what I deposited for you in the bank. Doesn't it? I'm going to give you two reasons why God said be strong and very courageous. Because in case you haven't figured it out yet, right, there are some challenges when we believe. Have you figured that one out yet? There are some challenges when we walk with God and we believe God and we start a walk of faith with God, there are some challenges that come our way. Now, this is where I wonder, you know, I wonder, see, just this verse should eliminate, understanding this verse means that you should never ask why you have some difficulties. Because somewhere along the line, some have thought, that if I ever have enough faith and I am perfect enough, then everything will just go well all the time. You understand that is not in Scripture. What is in Scripture is what I just told you, right? God has given you something. He is with you. No matter what comes, you'll overcome. And He will never leave you. But what is also in there is you're going to have to be strong and brave and courageous. Why? Because obviously there's going to be some difficulties and obstacles to overcome along the way. So there's enemies in the land, right? The walls of Jericho, when you get there, are still going to stand. And every step of the way, you're going to have to trust in God, and every step is going to be a different instruction. Sometimes God is going to say, take the sword and fight. Other times he's going to say, no, this one, don't fight it. No, just worship and praise and the walls will fall down. Here's the problem that we have, that we tend to make methods of it, right? I know I made fun on purpose and I, and I do it affectionately, right? Again, you know, white suit and this, and then having a choir of 100 people singing, you know, uh, Hallelujah, hallelujah, does not mean that God is going to heal. God told Benny Hinn to do that. Did he tell you to do that? You know, we may sing a cappella, and the angels cry, holy, and the anointing will fall the same way, and I don't have a white suit. And I don't have a, well, I do have a bit of an accent, but, you know. And I know I had friends, you know, I had friends that, when they read that, 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 how many of you remember that Smith Wigglesworth once uh, came across a lady that had a tumor, a growth, and the Lord told him, told him to punch her. He punched her, 
and the tumor dissolved. So I had all these friend evangelists and they can't wait to punch somebody. And I thought, you better. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I say, it better be God because you're going to get sued, <laughs> you know. You're going to hurt somebody. It better be God. <laughs> Is this helping you? So don't do whatever somebody, right, else has done. You have to do, you have to think. So you're armed with all that, right? The call and the anointing and like that, and I'll leave you to forsake you, but there's going to be challenges. So I wonder at things. This is what I wonder. I wonder why, why, why are people surprised when obstacles or when there are challenges? We should not be surprised. We should say, well, thank God he tells the truth and he warned me. And that's the time when I have to be brave and strong because then we understand that all the, cha- the, the more challenges come, the stronger we get. That's all that's going to happen. You get better and better at solving problems. And Lillian Yeoman said that a good diet of devouring giants and solving problems will make you unstoppable in Christ. Instead of, you know, wondering and losing your faith and whining and saying, because God says the opposite. He says, be strong and very courageous. <laughs> there are challenges, right? And two, listen, here's, now here's the other reason why God said this. It's because God has done his part, right? His part is, I've given you the land. I release my word, just good as done. I'm with you, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But now, you're going to have to be strong and you're going to have to do your part and you're going to have to step on it and possess what I said you can have. So then I wonder at this point at our Calvinist friends, you know, and, and even, even sometimes our grace people friend that say, well, God has done it all. It, it's, it's true. But you also need this part. Because try saying God has done it all, which is the truth, right? And just sit there and do nothing. I don't see that in the sacred text. I see God has done it all, so it's his will, it's his plan, it's his glory, it's his anointing, it's his everything. But then I see God saying, now roll up your sleeves and you do your part. Because if you don't step on it, you're not going to have it. So I've done it all. But you want your healing, you have to get it. You want a raise, you have to go after it. You want a bigger house, you have to go after it. You want, uh, you want a better car, you have to go after it. You want better relationships, you have to go after it. I see that in the text because it's God and us. And I wish that the body of Christ would stop fighting over that because there's nothing to fight about. The two go together. <clears throat> Do you see it in the text? So he says, now, roll up your sleeves. Do it. Go after it. Because Christianity is a contact sport. It's not, you know, it's not a walk in the park. It's not a walk in the beach with, you know, a flower and the peace sign. It's, it's more like a boxing match which Paul uses that, that, that analogy, is more like running a race, and once in a while you're going to get punched. And when you get punched, you can't be surprised and fall apart and say, oh my God, what did I do wrong? Well, man, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you didn't do anything wrong. Maybe you did just everything right. Right? And so the two go together. But in the end, it's his strength, it's his power, it's his will. Because I can claim anything that I want to if he didn't say you can have it. Why can I claim healing? Why can I claim healing? Because he said, by his stripes you've been healed. Why can I claim my needs met? Because God has said, see, it's in the limits of what we can have. I will supply your need. Right? But along with that go a whole bunch of other things. Hallelujah. Amen? Including rolling up your sleeves, working, getting a job, right? 
being on time, being excellent, sowing, reaping, without that other side, without the my part, I'm not going to be blessed the way that God wants me blessed. So there's challenges, and there's our part. We have to do our part. Say, I have to do my part. Say, God does his part. I do my part. And without any doubt, God's part is bigger, <laughs> right? You know the analogy that I like to use, the elephant and the mouse crossing the jungle bridge, you know? The jungle rope and wood bridge. Think Indiana Jones, right? Elephant and the mouse crossing, obviously the bridge is shaking. And on the other end, the mouse says, boy, we made big waves, didn't we? Yeah, but, you know, it was the elephant that really, compared to you, made the waves, right? But you were still there. And you had your part. So God is the elephant. He does, he's done it all. But this is our part. And our part is just believing and being brave and not quitting, not giving up. One of the greatest secrets to success is get up one more time when you're knocked down. Because <laughs> some of the people that I mentioned before, Wayne Gretzky and Badger Johnson in particular, I remember looking up the statistics at the time, not only do they have the most baskets or the most goals, but they also have the most misses. Isn't that interesting? Wayne Gretzky missed more shots than anybody else. But he also scored more goals than anybody else. Magic Johnson too. Why? But we don't remember them for the record of most missed baskets. We remember them for the records of the most baskets. Because every time we, they missed or they didn't work out like that, they said, well, I'm going to go and try again. <laughs> I'm going to get up and try again. But how long do we keep on going? Until we dunk it. Dunk it. Right. That's how it's said, right? Did I say it right? The ball in the basket. Isn't that called a dunk? I know, I know my modern language. I know my stuff. I'm cool. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Right? You still with me? Okay, let's keep on reading. Go on, go on, go on, go on. Verse 8, right? See, now there it is, verse 7, yeah. That you may observe to do according to all the word which Moses, my servant, commanded you. So, who, who has to obey? We do. Who does the obeying? Is God going to obey for you? You know, God, is it true that God can do? The answer is yes, by the way, okay. Is it true that God can do anything? Is it true? But he's not going to do everything. Right? Is, is God going to pray for you or do you have to pray? Right? Is God going to give tithes for you or do you have to give tithes? That'd be nice if God did it for you, wouldn't it? Okay? But you have to do it. I have to, if I don't give... God's not giving for me, right? It's the same, it's the same with, with, with evangelism, right? Is God going to tell people about Jesus or are you and I going to tell people about Jesus, right? Because he called us to do it. Angels are not going to do it. God's not going to do it. It's our job to do it. So you just read scripture and whatever God says he does, he does. And whatever he told us to do, we do. Put the two together and you get wonderful results. So verse 8, and I'm going to conclude, verse 8 says, right, verse 8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, you shall meditate in it day and night. So stay in the word, right? And then continue with verse 8, please, right? And then he says, that you may be careful to do according to all that is written, right? Do you see that? So who obeys the word? Now look at the last part, and then we conclude. Look at the last part. The last part says, then you will make your way prosperous. You will make your way prosperous. Do you see in that God's part and your part? Do you see it? Right? 
Do you see that it would be incomplete to say, well, I'm just waiting for God to drop it on me. I'm just waiting for God to do it all. Because there's a truth in that. He has done it all. But then he says, see, because I've done it all and because I decreed it, now you go ahead and make your way prosperous. And the only way that you can make, the only reason why you can make your way prosperous is because I said you can. But you have to do it. I, I spent a few days with a minister that if I, told you the name, you would know who he is, but I don't like to throw names or drop names. And I talked about this with him. I said, you know, there's a lot of teaching on the sowing and the reaping part, and it's true. But then I said, but then it seems like there's something missing, because if it was just a sowing and the reaping, I should have $10 million in the bank. I should. I've been tithing for 45 years. You know that I do. Every time I get an offering, the first part is God's. Do some math, I should have a few million dollars in the bank. Well, he pointed out, well, there's your part and God's part. So I pointed out, because it was right, we were eating ice cream, I said, well, and then he gave me some examples, right? One example he gave me was simple. He said he, he was driving one day next to some swamp land, and he said, I heard something inside by the swampland, and he did. He bought it something for like $80,000. Two years later, City Hall bought it for him for a million and a half because they were building a highway through there. So he said, see, that was God's part, spoke to me, my part, I had to buy it. So I said to him, you know, I've had things like that happen to me in my life. Have you ever had something like that happen to you in your life? Right? And, but I didn't act on it. I didn't act on it, but I've had things happen, you know. You should get that. You should do that like that. And then two years later, if I had done it, something, you know, would have happened like that. So I thought, okay. <clears throat> and, and I said to him, well, shouldn't you preach this side too? So he told me about another minister that, you know, God told him to buy that piece of property. He bought the piece of property that has oil in it. This is Texas. And now he gets money from selling the oil. So that was God's part, was leading him, his part was doing it. So I said to him, I asked him, we're eating ice cream, I said, well, why don't you guys, I don't hear that side of it much, I just hear, you know, the sewing, he says, why don't you teach that? He said to me, well, that's up to you pastors to teach that. That's what he said to me. But then he said to me, but I think I'll do a series on that because you're right, we need to talk about wise investments obeying God, obeying the leading of the, she says, go here, do this, stand there, do that, because that's a part of how God does it. Are you listening? And then he said to me, but you know, now that you talked about it, he said, I think I'll do a series on it. You know what I said to him? I said, you're going to send me a check off of your series, because I, <laughs> I inspired it. I'll see if he does now. He kind of laughed. He didn't promise, but he laughed. So it's in there. Isn't it in there? Uh, so it says, then you will make your way prosperous. Make your way prosperous means you got to get up, you got to study, you got to prepare, you got to be on time. I'm talking about your job, right? You have to do, go beyond what the boss says. The boss has to be able to rely on you. And then, you know, he'll give you a promotion, and then he'll bless you, and then maybe they open another branch somewhere, and he'll put you in charge of it, and then one day you own your own business. Christianity is not magic. It's, miracles are not magic or superstition. Miracles follow spiritual laws. And I'm outlining some spiritual laws. You will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. You want to make your way prosperous? I do. <laughs> then I wonder at the other side of the Bible, I say, well, why, why would you criticize anybody that's prosperous? God promised it. <laughs> Am I doing okay? Am I doing okay? <clears throat> Hallelujah. You will make your way prosperous. And you will have good success. 
Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to stop here. <sighs> to put it all together and it has all the elements. God called you. Find out what God says you can have. Find out what God says you already have. You'll find a lot of things you already have. And then you put it together with the Lord is with me like he was with Moses, like with Joshua, like David. He's with me. And he will never leave me nor forsake me. But now I got to roll up my sleeves, be strong, be courageous, step on it and go after it. I will not step outside of what God has given me. But dear God, I want to step all over what God has given me. I want to mark with my footstep the blessings that God has given me. You have to mark them with you and say, this is mine in Jesus' name. And it's mine, not because I'm arrogant, because I'm grabbing it out of the, but because God said it is mine. So blessing is yours. Abundance is yours. Peace is yours. You got to step all over peace because, because, because the devil will try to rob it. Right? Health is yours. Joy is yours. A good, good, good marriage is yours. Right? A nice house is yours. <sighs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah.